Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Power of Design and Innovation presented by Toyota Mirai. Design is so much more than a good looking product or brand. It's one of the most powerful forces in our lives. Whether or not we're aware of it, design influences what we think, the way we feel, and even the decisions that we make. As entrepreneurs, artists, and creatives, we must look to the future, not just at current trends, in order to survive. Advancements in technology offer endless opportunities for innovation, and great design is what intrinsically drives this process. Today's most disruptive brands are at the confluence of technology, design, and innovation. And in a world where potential customers give your website or social media account literally just 1.5 seconds to capture their interest or not, design and presentation are at the core of that almighty first impression. Today, I am so excited to be joined by three people who know firsthand what it takes to design the future. So without further ado, let's get into it. Please welcome Andrew, Jackie, and Drew. Thank you for joining us all today. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thanks, we... Of course, I'm so excited for this. Before we jump into the conversation, I would love for each of you to give us a 30 second hello and introduction to yourselves, your name, your title, and what it is that you do. Maybe we'll start with Andrew. Sure. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, thanks for being here today and thank you for having me, Sonia, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm the founder of Dialine, which has become the largest package design community online. I teach sustainable package design at Art Center in Pasadena. Um, and I co-own Print Magazine, which began as a printed publication in 1940. Amazing. Jackie, let's move to you. Uh, thank you. Yes, my name is Jackie. I'm a senior engineering manager at Toyota in the research and development department, where we work on the fuel cell electric vehicle called the Toyota Mirai, which for those who aren't familiar with it, it is an all electric vehicle, but instead of plugging it in and, re and recharging it, we refill it with hydrogen, which takes five minutes or less and gets you back on the road with 400 miles of all electric range. I love it. I'm so impressed by that. And Drew, on to you. Thank you, Sonia and Unique Summits. My name is Drew Kataoka, and I am the founder of Drew Kataoka Studios. We're the leading uh, fine art studio in Silicon Valley, and we are serving top contemporary art collectors in over 30 countries and five continents. The art we make is highly experiential, and it's based on our vision of the artwork as a living organism that transforms the environment, is different in every new interaction with it, and we even believe it can enhance your creative well being. Uh, we're primarily today creating in three genres, our Ambrosia series, where each artwork has 196 billion configuration permutations. Secondly, our Celestial Lace, which is our mirror polished stainless steel sculptures. And finally, uh, our technology art, which ranges from virtual and augmented reality to biofeedback to art in space. Wow, biofeedback. I can't wait to dig in further. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm going to start. There's so much to talk about. Uh, my first question is for everyone. I'd love to know. Um, I think that design plays such an important role in all facets of life and in every endeavor. A lot of the audience is, is entrepreneurs and small business owners. Why do you think it is that design plays such an important role in our lives? I'd love to hear from anyone or all of you. I can kick that one off. Um, so our motto at Print Magazine is actually everything is design and design is everything. And it's, it's something I really, really believe in, because if you think about it, essentially everything non-natural in this world, it's designed from the chair you sit on to the computer in front of you to the car you drive. Um, everything around you is, is designed. Design is what it essentially enables human to, humans to live and thrive and, and survive on this planet. And, and design itself is, is an essential part of humanity. I, I can, love that. Anyone else? Sure, I can respond <laughs> to that. Uh, it's interesting, Andrew, you said that everything that's non-natural, but yet the natural world is filled with design and filled with art as well. So um, I, I would say that you know, at Drew Katoka Studios, our focus is art, but design is, is very important. And design is a delivery mechanism and it's a crucial one. So, you know, whether you're running a marijuana dispensary or a crypto business or a social network or 
creating a virtual reality artwork, you have to connect to the customer. And to do that, you have to have great design. But I think that sometimes, interestingly, design can be an obstacle to your goals. Things can actually be over-designed and sometimes they can be under-designed as well. And so for me, good design is about finding the right balance. But this is really interesting in, in technology, um, in technological mediums, often the goal with design is to remove all friction and just drive addiction. But in art, we do the opposite. Art often tries to stop you in your tracks, to add friction, to disturb you, to pose difficult questions. And so in art, adding friction can actually be advantageous. And so I think that's also why there's a misunderstanding often between what art is and what design is. And that's why in my view, the two should not be confused. Uh, in a nutshell, you can say that design answers hard questions and art asks hard questions. Um, design can make you comfortable, but art creates discomfort. Design is about making things that are human centric, uh, removing friction, making them intuitive, smooth, comfortable and natural. But, but good art also about being human centric, but in a different way, often adding friction, often being counterintuitive. But the paradox with art is that you still crave that experience, even though it might make you feel uncomfortable. So wow. much. <laughs> My mind was just <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, what are your thoughts on a different design? side of your brain than I do? <laughs> <laughs> Engineer and artist, literally. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, and to, to that point, when I think of design, because our, our team does not do the external design nor the interior design, we're a powertrain group. So we actually build the, the fuel cell system that powers the vehicle itself, right? So when I think of design, I think of systems design. And mm -hmm. you can't engineer the components in a vacuum. You have to know how they all work together, how the system design works as a whole. Same with the organization and the team. You need to have a system design component to how your team functions and how you support one another. And so the design of, of the organization, of the team, and of, you know, for example, the powertrain in our system is really critical because the components wouldn't function in and of their, you know, on their own in an independent vacuum. So when I think of design, really to our team, it's all on the systems level. How can we innovate? Uh, what tools do we need? Um, how do we keep our eye on, on that greater vision, that greater design? Yeah, I always look at design as, as kind of uh, for products. It's essentially in the world I live in. I live in you know, consumer packaging. So when I think design is designed to sell a product, to make a consumer fall in love with a brand, to really engage someone to, like, like Drew said, to make them feel comfortable. It's not, it's not for them to be scared of the brand. That's the opposite. You, know, you don't want that. You want, you want a consumer to really, really believe in your brand and, and fall in love with it. Well, I love that. I love that you mentioned product there, Andrew, because I'm going to uh, move to a question that I'd love to ask you. Um, I've known you for a very, very long time. I've seen you do a lot of different things, but the die line has been the business that you've had the entire time. It is the number one, number one website in the world around packaging and branding, which I think is really interesting. And last year, as you mentioned, just a few moments ago, you acquired Print Magazine, which is a longstanding amazing publication. So you are now kind of in the world of revamping and managing that. So you know what it's like to redesign and to evolve and innovate. I'm really curious what your advice is for small businesses on how they can overall improve their branding and their design. And then are there any differences between online versus print? Because I know you are very good with both. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple of small tips, a couple of tips for businesses. And I think like the most important, and it, it can sometimes be really obvious, but it's, it's, if, unless you're a designer, hire a designer. I think design is the biggest and best investment you can make. Um, a lot of stuff, small businesses have brilliant ideas for products that are just revolutionary, but, but design is that like cog in the wheel that you need for it all to make sense. So, you know, hiring a designer, yeah, it seems obvious, but um, it's an investment for a lot of these small brands. And, and I want to say it's an investment that you will get your money back. Um, hiring a designer will really enable your brand to come to life in ways that you couldn't imagine or couldn't do on your own. Um, and it's really quite, quite possibly quite possibly the best investment you can make. 
Um, the other tip for small businesses, and I always think of, of unique markets, and I always think of like the great products I find from all your vendors, and it's always such a source of inspiration for me. Um, and I think especially with the pandemic in mind is consumer behaviors are just changing. They're completely changing. And before this, they were changing fast. Um, and now it, it's, it's, it's warp speed. Um, post pandemic, it, it, what's changed is that for the first time ever, consumers are actually willing to spend more on consumer products if they are sustainable or environmental. Um, if they have a positive benefit for the environment, if they come in sustainable packaging, uh, consumers are actually willing to pay more for that brand. And it's actually the first time, one of the biggest things, it's like, okay, well, sustainable packaging costs more money. Um, now it does, it, you know, it might not anymore because we're kind of at price parity with a lot of things. But if it does, it's, it's a great investment to, to your brand because your consumers are willing to, to pay more for it. So we're at an interesting time that like, Hey, uh, you know, spend more money on your packaging and, 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 and let's get your consumer really, really engaged. And what it is, it's like consumers are just hyper aware and especially like with COVID and just like all the, all the think of ordering food and all the, the, the packages that you get and the trash that's consumed. It's like people are really, really hyper aware of this now. And if they weren't before, they are now for sure. Like there's no way you cannot like unsee all of the packaging that everyone has wasted through this pandemic. Like it's, that's all real. Um, but it's, it's exciting because like brands are changing and times are changing. And so we can really like reevaluate, like how we sell products and in the ways we sell them and, and sell them to consumers in a way that's going to just benefit the environment. And, and I think that's like my biggest focus going forward. And I think that's the most exciting part is, is really focusing on the environment and design has such a powerful, powerful tool in enabling, you know, designers and brands to, to actually like do good for the world. And also we enjoy great products. So it's like a, two, you know, a two for two. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think moving forward, small businesses, even though they're small, they are going to be able to find ways to also be sustainable. And oh, yeah. like you just said, I, someone will spend five more dollars if you educate them about the fact that there's a reason why they're spending five more dollars. So I think that's great advice. Um, Jackie, I am just like nerd girl fanning over you. Um, I'm super excited that you're here with us today. I'm really, really curious, um, kind of your career journey, which obviously is very hard to say in a, in a one to two minute soundbite, but I would like to know like why you chose engineering um, and then also you are the senior engineering manager at Toyota working on a really, really cool car. Like when I read all about the car and the functionality of it, but also the form of it, I was honestly, I was really, really intrigued. And it just like, I started researching and it's really a phenomenal car. So I'd love for you to just kind of share with all of us, like how you got your foot in the door, how you chose engineering. I, you know, you're clearly in a man's world, which I love. And so just tell us a little bit about that. And then, um, yeah, like your job today, what is it that you do? When you say R and D, I just like, I nerd out because I love R and D, but a lot of people don't even know what that means. So just explain that a little bit more. Sure. Um, I mean, actually, I, it's so funny hearing Andrew say, if, you know, if you want to design something, hire a designer. Because <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen an engineer try to design something. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> and that's actually how I, I, I how I got into this industry. Strangely enough, um, as soon as I was old enough to drive, I really fell in love with cars, with everything in the auto industry. And I started, you know, working at Pet Boys as a mechanic. But I draw cars all the time. I was always, always drawing cars. And I actually wanted to be a designer. And I submitted my designs to a, a GM design school, and they. <laughs> pretty much flat out told me that I'm not creative enough, which is totally valid when it comes to that, that side of the brain stuff. That's just not how I was wired. So he said, well, you know, have you ever thought about being an engineer? And I had never even heard of an engineer before. So I looked into it and I flew out to Michigan and totally fell in love with the idea of, of being an engineer. So it was a very strange path to get there that went through a failure in trying to enter the design space that ended up pointing me towards engineering. And then um, in 2003, I was introduced to fuel cell technology. And, you know, as, as Andrew mentioned, once you 
once you see something, you know, like like the gross injustice against the environment right now attributed to oil, um, you can't unsee it. And so as soon as I, I entered the engineering space and I learned about, you know, petroleum dependency and climate change wasn't a thing yet at that point, um, but air quality sure was, right? So um, as soon as I, my eyes were open to these issues, I wanted to work on all electric zero emission vehicles. And so now it's been 18 years in the making for me. And in 2014, we launched our first production all electric vehicle called the Toyota Mirai, which again, we refill with hydrogen and it creates electricity on board as we're driving. Then again, last year we launched the second generation, which has a lot of improvements and efficiencies, which is stuff that we do at research and development. But also what we've done is we've taken that same fuel cell stack that creates the electricity from the hydrogen and from the oxygen in the air, and we've put it into different applications. So right now we have two class eight semis that are running at the ports of LA, Port of Long Beach to demonstrate we can pull 80,000 pounds with zero emissions. And so imagine the impact, right? If we replace those 16,000 diesel trucks that go in and out of the port every day with zero emission trucks. I mean, the impact is, is huge and, and that was a success. And so now we're looking at using our fuel cell power modules that, as we call them now to replace pretty much any diesel or gasoline engine that we can. So we're really in this exciting, innovative space as Andrew said, we're seeing a huge shift in the, in the norms of the automotive industry of where our traditional boundaries were of where our research and development touched. Now we're looking at every opportunity that we have to move to zero emission power and it's, it's really exciting. I love that so much. And it's just such a, it's a field that obviously I am not in in my day-to-day. -day. I'm in like small, the small business world. So to hear from someone who is not in my world and is really looking at large macro changes. I, I love it. Um, Drew, you are a great friend of mine and I'm super excited to get your perspective. Your artwork focuses on breaking the artificial boundary between art and technology and science. In fact, this is so cool, everyone. Your artwork up was featured in the first zero gravity art exhibit at the International Space Station. That is like the coolest, you are definitely the coolest person that I know. Um, and so I'm super interesting, how does, how does technology influence your creative process? And then how can we all use technology to think differently and think more imaginatively? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question, Sonia. I, I source a lot of my inspiration from interacting with friends, collectors, and community in Silicon Valley, scientists, technologists, entrepreneurs, astronauts. Sonia, I even have a couple of great friends who are fighter jet pilots. Um, so I believe people who are creative in their fields can be very enriching from an artistic perspective. And also one of the main Zen principles is action over theory. So I'm particularly drawn to people who embody that. Uh, specifically, you, you asked about the artwork that I had created for the first zero gravity art exhibit in space at the International Space Station. And it's really an illustration of all the things that you're asking about. Um, the artistic medium that I chose for that artwork was Japanese ink, paper, and finally, relativistic effects. So um, the backstory is that Richard Garriott, who is a celebrated video game developer, he was about to fulfill his childhood dream of following in his father's footsteps. Uh, his father was an astronaut uh, and becoming an astronaut for Richard was a dream of his that he had had ever since he was a boy. And to commemorate that, he wanted to curate this zero gravity art exhibit in space at the International Space Station. And he invited me to participate. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that there were many, many constraints. Certain materials were banned, non-acidic papers, the sizes were very specific, the artwork had to be able to roll up. So I started with my brush, Japanese ink and paper. I'm, I'm half Japanese, born in Tokyo and have been trained from an early age in the ancient 2000 year old art form of sumie or Japanese ink painted so painting. So what I did was create one distilled image that suggested two things. On the one hand, a rocket in the initial stages of takeoff and the exhaust kind of trailing behind it, but also implying a brush painting and a brush stroke. But then I wanted to connect the past and the future and bring art and science together while creating a conceptual artwork. So I embedded relativistic effects into the piece. 
And what I did was I asked Richard to cut out a piece of the painting that he would take into space. That was the celestial piece. The rest of the artwork would remain on earth and that would be the terrestrial earthbound or mission control aspect of the artwork. And so I designed the artwork to be separated from itself. One piece traveled to space with Richard Garriott's mission, the other remained on earth. And here's the really exciting part. Due to the effects uh, that uh, were described by Einstein in his special theory of relativity, the celestial piece is a tiny fraction of a second younger than the terrestrial piece, making the reunited artwork two different ages and actually a conceptual portrait of the Garriott's son and father, both astronauts during different eras, uh, represented by these two different pieces of the artwork, each of them a different age. Wow. I know, I just, <laughs> where do you go from there? I'm just like, my. Wow. I'm just, it's so interesting to hear it's so interesting to hear everyone's process behind what they create and then the thought process and then what you end up with. I just, I love that so much, Drew. So I want to talk even more about innovation because that, I mean, the capacity to even think about all of those different elements. I'm not sure if I have that capacity, I'll be honest. Um, Andrew, uh, talking, kind of diving more deep into innovation. So since you launched the dial line, which was, a long time ago, let's just say. I won't, <laughs> I won't <laughs> repeat it. <laughs> um, there have been so many developments. You know, Instagram didn't exist then. I mean, technically, when it comes to technology, so much has happened in even just five years, but a decade, so much has happened. So you've had the opportunity to really follow these developments and observe how they influence something very specific, which is packaging and that whole industry, as you've told us a little bit already. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen when it comes to kind of this confluence of like sustainability, but also technology and social media, which really rules so many of our lives now on a day-to-day -day basis. What are some of those um, changes that you've seen in packaging design? Yeah, like you said, I, I started this in 2007, so I will age myself. Um, so it's been a good like 13, 14 years. Um, and it's been pretty cool because I've been able to see like a snapshot almost of like each generation of packaging. In, in 2007, like I was taking pictures on a, on a not even an iPhone because that didn't even exist. It was just a, a camera I would sneak into Target and I would, you know, post pictures of packaging. And it, obviously that's, that's changed a lot. Um, but the biggest kind of shift over the course of that, it's just, it's been e-commerce and it's tied into social media and it's become like e-commerce has become the biggest and most important shift in packaging um, that, that I've seen in the past uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, in the next 12, 13 years, next 10 years, it's, it's sustainability. Uh, and that's the biggest shift that's happening underway right now. Um, a, a little background, I, I had a, a, a brain injury and a spinal cord injury about three years ago, um, and I had emergency brain surgery. And I woke up out of brain surgery. Um, a week later, I'm recovering, and I'm looking at Dialine, and my friend Jessica brings me the National Geographic Plastic or Planet issue. And I'm just looking at, you know, this bottle, this striking image on the cover, and I'm seeing these two, and I'm just... I, it, but my life changed in that moment. It, it made me realize like, okay, I'm a part of the problem. I represent this industry to a very large degree and I'm a very large part of the problem. So it was then that I decided, okay, this, this has to change. I, I dedicated the next um, year of my life just, just digging into what sustainable packaging is. What does it mean? Where is it going? Um, and, and that's where we're going to see the most innovation. And it's, it's, it's in interesting ways. And it's not, it's not in like these big, like, you know, big theoretical ways. It's in like really small and simple ways, like, uh, like shampoo bars, like things like that, where we're changing the format of products. Cause it's like, okay, why are we shipping around all this water? It's so unsustainable. Um, and and it's, it's, it, that's where the innovation's coming from. So it's, it's, it's exciting to, to see the, the beginning of that happening. Um, and I think, I think COVID is really gonna be the catalyst for that, um, you know, pushing forward even more. But yeah, we kind of just got to a point of this, as an industry where at least I believe like, hey, like th there's a lot of waste going on in this industry and it's not sustainable. And, and that's the biggest shift we're gonna be seeing over the next, over the next 10 years. Yeah, I think so too. 
Um, are there any trends that you're seeing like very, very specifically, like, I, cause I mean, you know, you know, there's yeah. all these different types of straws like, and materials that straws are now being made of. Like oh, yeah. what are a couple of the trends that you're seeing? Okay, so uh, if anyone's familiar, there's a service um, called Loop, um, loopstore.com. It's founded by TerraCycle and it's basically they're reinventing the way consumers buy products. So you go on to Loop Store, and this totally sounds like an ad, and it's not, I'm not affiliated with them, I promise. Um, you go on to Loop Store, buy your products, and they come in permanent packaging. So it's almost like the days of the milkman where you pay your deposit for your glass bottle. But this is like Hagen dazs Tide, this is all the major national brands, yet they're coming in stainless steel packaging. And that gets shipped to your house, you use the product, um, and you ship this tote bag, and it gets reused over and over and over again. So this like just the way brands are thinking about even the way they're selling products is different. It's no longer just like, oh, let's make, you know, change this from plastic to paper or use a different material. It's like, OK, well, why are we doing this in the first place and how can we redesign the system itself so that it works better for consumers and for the planet? And that's where like the exciting part is coming from is seeing is seeing like the big brands doing these really big things and changing the, the like the, the system. But then there's like the, the small upstart brands that are doing like the shampoo bars and that are taking water out of their products and they're, that are creating like really innovative products that the big brands can't do. So it's, so it's like this weird time, but it's really cool because it's a really big opportunity for like the smaller brands of the world to really like innovate. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I agree. I mean, larger, larger corporations are very slow moving. And so from an entrepreneurial perspective, the one thing that we all have, the leg that we have up is that like, we can move fast and quick. And when a small business owner or an entrepreneur has an idea or is passionate about something, they can actually affect that change quickly. Um, Jackie, <laughs> uh, the mission of your group is to improve quality of life by developing fuel cell solutions to replace gasoline and diesel, as we just heard, which when I first heard of all the work that you were doing, I honestly, I didn't even know hydrogen was an option. Like I, I will admit, I just started, I was like, how do they do this? And so then I dove really deep into the website and I downloaded all the brochures. I was reading all about the technology. It's really, really fantastic. So um, obviously we've mentioned before that the Toyota Mirai is an all hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. What is it about the technology that makes it so innovative? And just like describing to people like me who are coming from a place of not knowing anything about that industry or the technology, like how does it work? <laughs> Yeah, um, valid, totally valid question and not surprising at all that you hadn't heard of hydrogen as a thing. That's a, a kind of common theme that, that we're hearing from customers is, you know, when they hear electric, they only hear battery electric, they don't think fuel cell electric. So that is a, an opportunity for education. Um, I think what makes hydrogen and fuel cell electrification so uh, innovative is, um, you know, as a whole, we're moving towards electrification of our transportation sector, right? And so really there are two options for that, fuel cell electric and battery electric, and they definitely exist you know, together in this space. We have customers who are going to prefer one over the other based, based on applications. Um, the beauty of the fuel cell vehicle is really the simplicity of the electrochemical reaction that's creating the electricity that's driving the vehicle. So all that's actually happening when you're driving the vehicle is you're taking hydrogen from the tanks, right? It's just flowing from the high pressure tanks oxygen from the air, just from the traditional intake system, and the two combine to form water. That water goes out the tailpipe, and a byproduct of that reaction is the electricity that drives the vehicle. So it's really one of the most simple, you know, chemical reactions uh, on the planet, and we're using it to fully power a vehicle. And, and I recommend if you have a chance to get behind the wheel of a Mirai and drive it and experience it, because it's really a phenomenal driving experience. And to think that that the reaction that's occurring to give you that experience is just the combination of hydrogen and oxygen is really spectacular. And then also when we look to sustainability um, in the transportation sector, you need to know where the fuel is coming from, right? And hydrogen is a domestically produced renewable fuel. And you can use whatever your local feedstock is to create your hydrogen. Right now we make, um, I think, 10 million metric tons of hydrogen annually in the US alone. So it's already a commercial 
commodity. And now we can get it from biogas, from um, waste streams. We can get it from what's called electrolytic hydrogen, which is you know, using renewable electricity to create hydrogen from water. So we have all these different options of how we create that hydrogen. It really makes for a sustainable, renewable, zero emission future for the transportation sector. So it's, it's a really exciting, the opportunities that are presented there. I love that so much. And I, I honestly, everyone should go take a nerd dive into this technology because as soon as I started to read about it, I was just like, okay, next car, I, like Pretty the cool. next car has to be more sustainable. I live in LA, so not having a car is, is very hard, but um, moving forward, yes. Like I'm so excited to test drive. I, I do definitely want to test drive and see how it is. Um, Drew, in your artist statement, you say that, Society and even for our survival, creativity is extremely important. And I agree with you so much. Creativity and also creative thinking are two that just go hand in hand. And it's really what kind of breeds, I think, innovation. Um, I'm curious, what role do the arts play in proposing solutions to some of these modern challenges that we're facing? Well, Sonia, we are facing some really challenging, daunting mega problems. Andrew and Jackie have been talking about the environment uh, already. So global warming, pandemics, as we've been experiencing this year, overpopulation, globalized terrorism, to name just a few. And these problems are challenging uh, exactly because the conventional solutions have failed. And so what I think is that we need, need radically new um, approaches and creative vision that's kind of at the level of people like Leonardo da Vinci and Newton. And that's the type of vision that we need. We can't mess around kind of optimizing at the local maximum. That doesn't cut it anymore. And so, uh, you know, this hyper boost of creativity, it's so important either to address these problems at their core here on earth or to help us become a transplanetary civilization and uh, escape uh, this mess that we have created. So what is the role of art in all of this? I believe that art really challenges our view of the world and it also helps us establish new links between things that we previously would not have put together it kind of sets our neural links on fire, if you will. And therefore art is a key component of any creative regimen. Uh, there's a really great study by Robert Root Bernstein from the University of Michigan, which I highly recommend anyone take a look at. And he took a survey of scientists in three groups, one average scientist in the general population. Secondly, scientists at a slightly higher level, that meant they had to be admitted to the National Academy of Sciences or the Royal Academy of Sciences. And third, the highest grade were uh, scientists who had won a Nobel uh, a prize in science. And uh, he surveyed all those groups and asked them if they had an arts avocation. And by an arts avocation, he meant a deep arts practice, not just a passing hobby. So um, he found that one out of three of the average scientists had one um, and five out of 10 of the National Academy of Sciences scientists had one. But when it came to the Nobel prize winning scientists, nine out of 10 of them had a deep arts avocation. And so when you break that apart and you look at the um, numbers in this study, what it amounts to is that Nobel laureates in the sciences are 25 times as likely as the average scientist to sing, dance, or act, 17 times as likely to uh, be a visual artist, and 12 times as likely to write poetry or literature. And so, you know, for creatives, for entrepreneurs, for, for business people, uh, for, for all of us, um, you know, what, what can we take from this? I, I would say that it's important to go outside of your comfort zone from a disciplinary standpoint and to be more interdisciplinary, uh, to, to even just follow your tastes and even find an art form that really speaks to you, whether it's painting or sculpting or poetry, and then make sure you really dedicate time to that every week to go and immerse and spend time in your busy schedule. 
Um, and I think you'll find that this recharges you, uh, kind of stimulates your creativity and ultimately gives you a lots of new ideas and perspectives. Um, you know, Einstein himself was an accomplished violinist and, and playing the violin was not just a, a fling or kind of a hobby. He would often go to the table way past midnight in the kitchen and start playing when he couldn't figure out a problem and just play for hours and then finally shout, Eureka, his, his son reports these, these stories. And so um, playing music actually helped him untangle his thought process. Uh, another way to be more interdisciplinary is to audit your teams, the people you're working with. Does everybody look the same? Do they have all the same CVs and same backgrounds? Maybe that needs to be mixed up. Maybe more uh, people with more artistic, more design backgrounds need to be incorporated. Um, and also even audit your physical space to make it more interdisciplinary. Steve Jobs famously did this revolutionary thing with the layout of Pixar, where he uh, created the atrium such that people from all these different departments would be forced to cross paths and they wouldn't just be compartmentalized into their little boxes in the building. And uh, he and many at people at Pixar credited that uh, design of the building with unleashing so much creativity and so much interdisciplinary uh, creative sparks. Oh, I love that. I'm going to guess that you play an instrument. And if you do, or maybe play many, what is it? I've been <laughs> playing the flute for my whole life. And I really love this relationship between the oral and the visual. And actually, uh, I think it's an interesting question to ask oneself when, 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 when playing music, what is the visual that you are trying to impart in people's minds and all of them will have different visuals but then also conversely when you're creating an image um, what are the sounds that you are, are are trying to suggest or trying to provoke in the listener and so this idea of sounds that are embedded in the visuals or visuals that are embedded in the sounds just as a framework as a way of thinking um, can can lead to a lot of interesting uh, results I love that. I sadly do not play any instruments. I, I did play piano it's and then I- late. It's never too late. I quit. It's, you're right. It is not too late and I will probably try piano again. So I've been inspired by you, Drew. I will try piano again. <laughs> um, Andrew, now that all businesses, whether small or large, like the mammoths, they're all fighting for attention online now because of the pandemic. So from a business perspective, just to, to tie it back into business, um, what are some of the tips that you have for the design and experience of unboxing? You've talked a lot about sustainability, which is something that we all need to think about and address, but you know, all of these small businesses, obviously many of them didn't sell online pre-pandemic. You know, they were all selling in person and they've all had to pivot like the rest of the world. And so now they are having to deal with these ideas of getting product out and selling, but also what do I do to selling all these products and shipping them in boxes? Like this isn't great. So I would love to know what your tips are for the unboxing, unpackaging experience, because also in some strange way, this term unboxing, like this has become also a trend on social media, like on YouTube, there are people making millions of dollars by doing these unboxing videos. So what are your tips for that experience and what like your average small business owner can do? Yeah, so this is all geared towards a small business owner with in mind. And there's an old saying that you only get one chance to make a, a good first impression. And, and that's absolutely the case. Um, and I like to call it YOLO, you only launch once. So you, you really like have one chance to do it. So it's really, really important that, that you do it right. Um, that, that shipper box, man, that's like the retail store now. We, we've been forced into this system um, because of COVID and, and it's gonna continue post COVID. E-commerce, like that, that box, that's your retail experience. 
that's all you get now. So it's it's become so much more important than ever that that box like exudes your brand. Like every aspect of that package should be considered from the graphics on the box, the finish, um, the way it opens, even the tape that seals it up, um, what's inside of it with the, the filling color. Are you giving them a, an, a unique experience? Is there a pop of color inside? You know, what is that, what is that little thing that you're gonna do that's gonna set that package apart? Um, and it, really each like layer of it is an opportunity for your brand to shine. I mean, you can have branded everything nowadays. You can throw things in there and create this like incredible, like they get, you know, extra gifts and, and they're wowed by it. And, you know, how are those products fitting in the box? I think that's a big part of it is like the actual structural package design that a lot of small businesses don't necessarily th uh, think of, or, uh, you know, it's, it's when that box gets shipped through the mail, are those like whatever you're selling, are they staying in place? And like something as simple as just like making sure that they're just secured perfectly in the box so that when you open it, it's the exact way you want it. Like that's super, super important. Um, and for, for smaller brands, it's, it's a lot easier nowadays because there's a lot of packaging companies like uh, Lumi is one and Packlane where you can do small print runs. I mean, you can order as low as one single box um, if you need to. So it's not a thing anymore where, where you're like, oh my gosh, I have to order a thousand boxes. I can't afford that or I don't have enough orders in. Um, no, you can do that now. You, you, can, you can jump in and, and really create this like incredible branded experience. Um, and it doesn't have to like cost, you know, a ton of money to do anymore. So my, my, exper my, my experience in this and my recommendation for, for brands is like focused on that shipper box. It's so important. Um, and investing that money in the shipper box, you have to also look at it like a marketing expense. Um, and, and, and say, look at like, okay, I'm spending more on the shipper box. I'm spending 30% more, for instance, 20% more for this branded one, this designed one. But this designed one, people are going to take pictures of, they're going to Instagram it, they're going to tag their friends, they're going to share it. So if you can create that incredible unboxing experience, whatever it is, um, it, it's, it's a marketing, a marketing opportunity. So that's how, that's how I'd like to look at it and really just like shift the way you're like thinking. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm spending more on the packaging, but no, this is, I'm spending more on marketing for my brand. Right. So interesting. Cause as you know, I launched during COVID, you know, I launched care package, a company that sends care packages to people. And we had to go through this process of like, are we going to do tissue paper? Are we going to do um, biodegradable peanuts? There, there really is so much out there that is sustainable for one, but also looks beautiful, right? And so it very much is about that that process. Um, you mentioned Pack Lane, which is who we use for boxes, and then there's like a tissue paper company, no issue that we found that we found out about, and they're great. And so I feel like there are these companies who are now like brands have been built because of COVID, oh, yeah. where they're realizing small business owners now like need all of these things um so uh, yeah i just love everything that you mentioned even, um, like, Jackie oh, sorry even as these, as these brands scale up like uh, these companies will also help you with that scaling and shipping for you so it becomes like yes. it can easier easily become a bigger thing very quickly and very fast too yeah i do think that's one of the things that is kind of why gen z like <laughs> Gen Z is just so different, obviously. Um, but, you know, I don't know anyone who's like 15 to 18 who doesn't have a business. Like they're all selling stuff. <laughs> they're all like, they're figuring out ways to create income for themselves as teenagers online. And what you mentioned there just like made me think about that because the technology is out there. You can start a business and then there are these businesses that can help you grow and start to fulfill your products, ship deal with customer service. It's really, really interesting. So thank you for all that insight, Andrew. Um, Jackie, so I'm just going to also, I keep saying that I'm fangirling over this, but as soon as I, as soon as I heard that I was going to be talking with you, and of course, because I did a deep dive into the car, the thing that I love about this car, and it's, I'm going to be fully transparent and like, it's the reason why I never got a Prius. Um, it's stylish. <laughs> the Mariah is stylish. It, it's actually sleek. And the form is just as beautiful as the function. And I think that's, I, I love when form and function match 
right? They're equal. It's not like they, someone has tried to slap a design on something or someone designed something beautiful and then tried to like figure out how to make it work and it doesn't quite work. Um, I think that the design just is, is actually to the level that I like design and designed goods in my life to be. So I'm really curious, you know, obviously the vehicle is very, very innovative, but the thing that attracted me to it, aside from the sustainability, of course, was that, that sleek look. And so I'm curious, how much of a role does the interior and exterior of the design play? And obviously, you know that you're going to do, you know, have a car with the fuel cell technology, and then you start to do the design after, or like, how does that play in to one another? <laughs> well, the fact that, that you, I mean, your, your response to the design of the vehicle is exactly what the designers were going for, right? And I think it was, it was noticed in the first generation Mirai that it was a very polarizing effect. People either loved it and saw it as like this quirky little environmental vehicle, or they hated it and were like, oh God, what is that design? <laughs> so to, I mean, to move to this, the second generation where the, the exterior design really exudes drivability, right? It looks sporty it looks fast and it is a rear wheel drive electric vehicle so it is um, it has a perfect 50 50 weight distribution of the powertrain so you talk about taking it on corners and the way that the vehicle responds when you're you know driving it it's it's spectacular and it's and it's demonstrated by that that clean line that you see on the outside it's actually you know, I was I was um, part of the launch for both of the vehicles where we invited journalists to come see them and, you know, the first launch was, you know, kind of lukewarm. The second one, um, when they pulled the cover off the car, the journalists actually went, <gasps> and kind of, there was this collective gasp. And it was so exciting to hear that because this vehicle has been so near and dear to the, the engineering team's heart that to now have an exterior that really um, it captured how innovative and what a special car it is uh, really meant a lot. And then when you look at the interior, they've made a lot of technical upgrades, right? So it's really demonstrating, you know, what I believe to be the most advanced electric vehicle on the market, right? You have all of your, your, um, your luxurious creature comforts, but then also all these technical capabilities, right? This big, you know, display touchscreen and all of the, um, the round sound. So it's, it's really meant to demonstrate both the driving experience as well as how advanced technically this vehicle is. And so it sounds like it got that point across to you as well, which is exactly what the designers were trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. What What is your favorite detail about the car? I'm just <laughs> curious. <laughs> uh, besides the powertrain, um, it, it's going to sound really funny, but it's actually there's this little copper accents on the interior that I just adore because I'm in this big metal I love metals and copper so that's my favorite little copper accents on the interior well, I, that sounds like that would be me too so I will keep an eye out <laughs> when I go test drive it because yes all about the copper and the rose golds and all of that yes ma'am um <laughs> So Drew, for you, technology is art, art is technology. You've described a lot of the, um, the thinking behind your work and the process and a lot of the different mediums. Like that, that's the thing that I love about you. I'm constantly surprised you're, you're, you're really kind of doing things in many different realms, which I think is so interesting. Um, how can businesses, entrepreneurs, um, designers, creatives, how can we work to unite the two cultures and social forces? And, you know, again, I, that statement that, that you have on your website of technology is art and art is technology, I think is really powerful. And it wasn't until I saw that on your website, that I was like, that's really interesting. So yeah, I mean, how can small businesses and entrepreneurs and creatives kind of um, bring those two two very polarizing, I think, usually cultures together. So I had coined this phrase that technology is art and art is technology uh, decades ago and have been saying it almost as a mantra. And I think of it almost like a cone. Uh, you know, a cone is a Zen puzzle that has no specific answer, but carries a higher truth. And some think of art and technology as two very separate things. But uh, in its highest form, um, art becomes technology. And uh, 
in technology's highest form, it becomes art. And if you just think about it for a bit, uh, or I invite the audience who's watching us now to think about it uh, and, and see what they come up with as they reflect on that idea. I, I think that exactly this mindset, uh, Sonia, of separating art and technology has been at the root of our, a lot of our problems uh, in global society along with short-term thinking. And so, you know, what can creatives, business people, uh, entrepreneurs do? I would say, make sure you have artists on your team, um, create exchanges, create, you know, find creative outlets for engineers and technical outlets for creatives uh, and encourage everyone to go outside of their comfort zones, create this surface area between different disciplines and different backgrounds within yourself and within your organization. Uh, something to think about is that Wozniak was a great technologist and Steve Jobs was a great artist. I love that. I love that. Also, I just have to say when you when you were talking about um, you know having people go outside of their comfort zones, for some reason, what I heard was also go outside. <laughs> and it just made me realize that I think that is, I don't know why I heard what you were saying, but also at the same time, the other side of my brain was like, that word outside is so important as well. Like for all of us to get outside of, our, of the indoors of our boxed in environments and just interact with and get out in nature more, because I do think that when you interact with nature more, you realize how much we need to preserve it. Um, and also just getting outdoors, I think really, it always, it's one of the things that inspires me, Drew, you talk about, you know, surrounding yourself with um, as many different types of people. I 100 so agree with that. And then also I think getting outside has always been one of those things, just that fresh air and, and um, really just like realizing how small we are, right? Like when I go for walks, I look up at, at the sky and I'm just like, we are so small. It, it always inspires lots of great creativity in, in my mind, at least. No, well, um, the Japanese have a concept of bathing in nature or immersing in nature uh, because it is something that will rejuvenate uh, one's creativity and have a restorative effect. And so in terms of creativity, also the way that we design our environments is very important. Are we letting nature in to our artificially constructed environments? And that's why people like Frank Lloyd Wright are so inspiring because they intertwined the natural and the man-made spaces. And so it's an interesting question to ask oneself in whatever small ways, whatever levers we have uh, at our disposal to see how can we interweave nature even into the places where we have to work, whether that's letting more sunlight in or creating skylights or the different views or vantage points that we're uh, positioning or even how we use art um, a lot of the artworks that we create are these reflective portals that actually open up parts of the outside and bring them indoors. So there's so many different things that you can do to make your own environment more creative. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so now I wanna move on to like quick fire advice. Um, I know all of you have such amazing things to say, so I'm excited for this. Um, so I'm gonna have all of you answer this first one which is what are the design tools that we should all be investing now to build a more sustainable future? What are those tools that we need? Non-plastic packaging, um, stop buying plastic. If you're creating, if you're, if you're a brand, stop, stop using plastic. Um, I, I think that's one of the best investments any brand can make and just ethically it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, so that that's that's where I'm at with it. There's I see so much plastic out there, and it's these upstart brands have such an opportunity to just ditch it and do something innovative. So like that's what excites me. So I would say it is great to invest in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality because it allows us to envision a whole world, a whole space, uh, a product contextualized within a particular environment without having to ship anything, without having to waste any materials and allows us to iterate very quickly. I mean, we do that here in the studio where we're building quite large scale sculptures and we can preview a sculpture for a client, have them walk underneath it, have them walk around it, uh, give, give, give feedback, share thoughts. Um, even 
parts or, or prototyping aspects, designing and engineering parts of these sculptures or parts of these artworks, or for other companies, car companies I know use virtual reality a lot as well. And it's extremely powerful. At this point, I still feel it's quite underutilized. Uh, and it's also just a wonderful creative tool for students, for young people to be able to think about, you know, think about the back of the napkin quick sketch, how that has led to so many great endeavors. Now imagine um, drawing something in three dimensions, or if you want to even say four dimensions, kind of adding time in, if you throw that into a gaming engine, where that can take you, if that's your first draft, you're going to be saving a lot on materials and shipping and on waste. Wow. That really applies to packaging too, because uh, uh, it, there's a lot of design happening in VR and AR environments so that you can see packages on a shelf so you can interact with it. Um, and I teach packaging and some of my students are designing in VR and it's just mind blowing to me. I'm just like, this is the future. So you are spot on with that. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with, uh, you know, to ensure a sustainable future, we need to invest in people. And I think, um, you know, from our, from Toyota's perspective, so all of our innovation comes from the creative mind of the people that, that are a part of our company. And, you know, to Drew's point, um, you know, she mentioned the need for diversity and actually there's a U of M professor I love as well, whose name is Scott Page. And he says um, that identity diversity maps to cognitive diversity, which is a way of saying how you grew up, who you are as a person affects what knowledge you, you acquire throughout your lifetime. And so each person has acquired this certain, you know, giant set, hopefully of knowledge. How do we take advantage of that resource? How do we get all those people who grew up in all these different ways and, and therefore have acquired all these different knowledge bases? How do we bring them all to the table and, and allow them to innovate, you know, foster that creativity Drew spoke to? How do we invest in the people to ensure that we're innovating in the way that we need to, to ensure a sustainable future? Yeah, Jackie. And when you talk about investing in people, I think that's so important. And it makes me think about education. Absolutely. And start with yes. our, our young people. And of course, you know, great companies, they're also um, investing in the education of their employees. But that's um, one of the reasons that I think that STEM uh, is a uh, a mistake, a, misno a misnomer. It's sending people completely down the wrong path. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and really uh, what will take us into the future is STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts and design, and mathematics, all those things integrated together. Uh, you know, we are just compartmentalizing different disciplines and kind of conveniently packaging them. But in the real world, they exist without any borders or boundaries. So we're just constraining ourselves when we want to cut all these things apart. I think that's such an interesting point. Wow. Okay. So these are going to be rapid fire questions. Um, I love, I love rapid fire questions. So this is to all of you. We're going to start with Drew to try to mix up, mix it up. Um, and it's interesting because I don't know how you're seeing the screen or how, like, I have a feeling we're all on different, uh, we all have different views, but in my view, it's Andrew, Jackie, Drew. So I'm mixing it up and starting with Drew. Um, so three, but all of you are going to answer this three people I look to for design inspiration are. So three people I look to for design inspiration or artistic inspiration, I would say first Leonardo da Vinci, because he was not only a designer, he was an engineer, he was a chemist, he was a strategist, he was a biologist, he was an artist, he pushed nearly every field that he was in, and it took other people uh, three to four to sometimes 500 years to catch up with what he was doing because he didn't publish his original findings. So I think he makes us think a lot about how language and educational uh, system are constraining us and kind of uh, forcing us to box ourselves in. And when we think about him, he seems very lofty, but he came from very humble beginnings. He was a bastard child. He was rejected from his family business. And if that's where he started and that's where he went, where do each of us want to go? The second person I would say is Duke Ellington, who transformed the musical landscape of America. 
And the third person I would say is Ike no Taiga, who lived from 1723 to 1776. And he was born the son of a lower ranking official of a silver mint in Kyoto. He lost his father while he was still a young child but he became acclaimed as supernaturally gifted painter and his paintings are revolutionary still to this day. I love that. Jackie, how about you? Um, <laughs> maybe maybe not so art artistically minded, but um, um, Ian Cartaviano, who's a designer at Toyota, probably Bill Gates, and then whoever runs West Elm's Instagram page. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Andrew, what about you? Uh, mine are also not as like, you know, Da Vinci and stuff, but um, <laughs> uh, Brian Collins, he uh, runs a design firm called Collins. He's just Collins. Um, the, the work he creates is incredible. He has an incredible program there we, where he, um, he has interns, uh, uh, these really developing talent and people of color and making it design inclusive. And that's a really big problem in the industry. Um, so I love what he's doing there. Um, and he also left me with one quote that's just like always just like stuck in my brain for like forever now. And it's designers live in between what is and what if. And it's just like, that's what design is. Designers are the ones who are creating. We can imagine and build that better future. And that's what we do. Um, my other is Debbie Millman. She's just uh, the queen of graphic design. I've, I'm sure a lot of graphic designers, I'm sure people know her on here, um, Design Matters podcast, if you haven't heard it. Um, it was a podcast before podcast was a term. Um, I, she, I love her to death and she's just such an inspiration. She's touched like 40% of uh, brands in any supermarket you walk into, which is just like mind blowing. Um, and the last is Tosh Hall. Uh, he's the global creative director of an agency called Jones Noel Ritchie, JKR. And they just do the most incredible branding work. Like every cool new brand coming out, it's them. Like it's just, it's them. Like they did uh, Duncan recently and that whole Brie brand. So just like super, super inspiring work from that team. Um, and yeah, those are my three. I just realized every time I'm, every time you guys have like, I'm taking notes by the way. So every time, and I just realized that like, probably when that happens, my head is like really big. And then it's just my, <laughs> but that's what I've been doing because you guys have been dropping like these amazing, whether it's like a company that I've never heard of or a, an amazing, beautiful quote through you've, you've given us so many inspirational quotes. So I like quickly scribbling um, in my, so I went to journalism school and we were taught how to like, it's not shorthand per se, but like we all have, I have this language that I'm able to write and no one can probably look at the paper and understand what's on it, but me. Um, so here's the next question. A design trend that I'm really into right now is? I'll go. Andrew. It's the 90s. <laughs> like the 90s are back, baby. And I'm loving it. Like I'm loving it. The 90s are huge right now. And I'm just like, this is my vibe. And I'm totally okay with it. Okay. <laughs> Jackie, how about you? Um, innovation. Love it. Drew. It's a bit of a technical design trend, but for me, it would be the emphasis on core web vitals. And that means performance, not crashing, uh, the design loading within the first view without any jiggling or latency or shaking. It's been an underappreciated and underinvested area. And I'm actually excited for Google's upcoming uh, May core algo update. I think it's going to be good for the internet as a whole. And it's going to be amazing for artworks and complex interactions, which are always the thing that breaks, breaks this stuff and, and pushes stuff to its limits. Wow. I love that. I'm just, I'm learning so many new things in literally the last 40 minutes. Um, so here's one, the biggest design faux pas is. Okay, and I, I, can, I can think of some people that would say the 90s. <laughs> In my world of consumer branding, it's when I, I order something that, that is like, and almost anything that I order, minus Amazon, if it comes to me in like just a craft brown shipping box, I'm, it just drives me freaking nuts. It's just like, it, it's just not okay anymore almost. Um, Amazon's an exception just cause it's like, you know, that's the, its own thing. But like if, if I'm ordering something from a brand, like I don't want it in a brown box, thank you. 
Unless that's maybe their aesthetic. Yes, exactly. Unless it's purposeful and intentional and it's crafted and designed all the way, 100%. Drew, how about you? Sonia, for me, the biggest design faux pas is not taking a long-term view of the user's welfare and just looking at them as a, a kind of walking money bag to be exploited and then just ditched in the next turn. I think this is at the core of a lot of the problems that we're experiencing today. And it's reflective of the short-term thinking that's been stifling our civilization and also posing an existential uh, threat for all of our survival. I have another one as well, and, and that would be not putting yourselves in the shoes of the user, uh, but I would take it further and saying not putting yourself in the fully immersive body of the user, which we can now do either with our imaginations, but we can do this now with virtual reality and all sorts of um, powerful avatars. And um, I think we should be ditching the concept of the user anyways, which sounds like drug user <laughs> or, <laughs> viewer, or viewer in art, which sounds kind of subservient and kind of below. Um, I think the so-called users or viewers should really be co-collaborators. In other words, you and they are on a journey together and you don't want to lose them. Absolutely. So insightful as, as always, Drew. Jackie, what is your design faux pas? I have to go with what initially popped into my head and my apologies to my friends at General Motors, but it has to be the Chevy Aztec. <laughs> I just can't. That's fair. That is fair. <laughs> Very fair. <laughs> I'm so not a car girl that I'm going to now have to Google because I don't, I don't even know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to hate it. So I'm, remember sure they think, I'm sure one of them has a Toyota that they think is equally as ugly. So exactly. wasn't there, wasn't there a Chevy Nova as well? That was uh, a car. I, I liked the Nova. It was, yeah. deployed, it was deployed to Latin America and Nova means Nova means does not go. And so talk about the design mistake or design. For <laughs> was that that's, a Chevy? That, I don't know. that's why being in contact with your regions who are in that location is so critical. Cultural, cultural awareness. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. <laughs> wow. I love that. Um, I actually really like the original Nova, which is probably like in the sixties. I think yeah. my parents, I think my parents had one. So there's like a nostalgia factor there. Me too. Yeah. I like the Nova. Love it. Um, okay. So my very, very last question for all three of you is my number one tip for designing the future is Jackie, let's go with you. Diversity. Andrew. Design for the planet first. Every design decision you make should put the planet first over almost anything else. Sonia, my number one tip for designing for the future would be this. It's, it's counterintuitive, but I would say look into the past and very far into the past. The big problems that we face are usually not unique in history. And if you can make the connections and, and that requires a lot of leaps of imagination often, but it can be very helpful. I mean, there are feats of engineering and artistry in the ancient world, for example, the, in, in Egypt and the ancient Egyptians, that not only can we learn from those things, we still today are not even close to figuring out how to replicate what they built using the same materials and constraints that they had. So we have a lot to learn from looking into the past as a way of helping us design for the future. I love that so much. What a great way to finish this conversation. It has been really eye-opening, this conversation to me, because I think I am stuck in the world of design, design, design. And so when you introduce technology and innovation, there's so much learning and so much potential. So I really, really am so grateful to the three of you for being here with us today. Thank you for everyone who is joining us at home. This has been such a wonderful day of learning and so many incredible conversations have been had. A very special thank you to Toyota Mirai for presenting the Unique Markets Digital Summit and a special presentation of this conversation with Andrew, Jackie, and Drew. It has been such a pleasure. Um, if you haven't already, please, please share with us on Instagram and Facebook by tagging us at Unique Markets and of course using the hashtag Unique Digital Summit. I 
say this because I think that community is so important. And in this digital virtual age that we have all been in in the last year, it's really hard to connect and network. And clearly the people who created the hashtag had a fantastic idea. And so, you know, tap the hashtag and you will be able to see all the other people who are taking part and have been taking part all day to day. And you can discover amazing new peers people who you can connect with and network with. And, you know, like Andrew was saying, um, if they are further along in their businesses, you can tap into them and ask them to, uh, you know, who are you using for packaging? Who are you using? Does anyone have a great graphic designer? Does anyone have a great photographer that they use? So really utilize the community aspect of a hashtag. Um, and again, it's unique digital summit. So please do that. It's a fantastic way to just join the conversation and discover others. Thank you all again for joining us. It has been such a fantastic conversation. And I'm so glad that Andrew, Drew, and Jackie were able to join. Have a fantastic day, everyone.